continuing chapter 10 with lecture number 3, and that should be a 3, just a second, and let me make that a 3, there we go. Um, and we're going to talk about the liquidity preference theory, and we're going to use this to develop eventually the LM curve. So again, here's the big picture. We've already talked about the Keynesian cross and used that to derive the IS curve. Now we're going to talk about the liquidity preference theory, and we'll end up using that to derive the LM curve. So this is how far we're at right now, and this is what we'll cover. So the liquidity preference theory is due to John Maynard Keynes, and basically it's a reaction to uh, the, um, uh, the quantity theory uh, of money. And, and basically the quantity theory of money, the equation exchange, the very simple quantity theory of money, um, which I personally like quite a lot, but um, it is very simple in that when you look at a money demand function, essentially what happens is if I just solve that quantity equation for money, I end up with um, M equals 1 over V times nominal income. And one of the issues with this is that within this very, very simple framework, well, there's no interest rates. Well, and interest rates are kind of the price of money, and so we have kind of a demand function that has no price, and well, that's a little weird, and so Keynes just said, well, let's take a step back. And let's think about, well, why do people want money? And he thought about the motives of holding money, and that's where this particular um, framework comes about. So, essentially, the supply of real money, we're going to use that as fixed. Now, I think this is a big, big time assumption. I'm not sure we really can say this because I think the, the economy generates its own money in a way, but that's actually for another class. It's called money and banking. I highly recommend that you that you take. But um, for right now, we're going to ex assume an exogenous money supply. That means that the Federal Reserve or the central bank, depending on where you're at, has control over the um, money supply. And well, that's going to equal, and that equals just some fixed amount. Notice that prices are constant. Why? Because prices, we're in a short run, so we're thinking prices are sticky. Next, demand for real balances. Now, I, I guess I've, I skipped over something because I'm talking about money here. But really, what we care about is something called real balances. So think of it like this if you have $10,000 in your checking account and a loaf of bread costs $1. How much do you have in your checking account? Well, you have enough to buy 10,000 loaves of bread. But what happens if the price of a loaf of bread went up to $10,000? Well, then all of a sudden you'd have the purchasing power stored up in your account to buy one loaf of bread. So really, you would probably way rather have the $10,000 with the lower price than the $10,000 with the higher price. And that's what we're trying to recognize when we talk about real balances. Now, you could just say, well, isn't that just real money? Well, I just think that term's kind of weird sounding to me. That's why we use this term, real balances. And it refers to the purchasing power represented by a particular pile of money. Okay, So that's what we're talking about, real balances. And it turns out that it's just, it's just the um, amount of money divided by the price level. Okay, So easy peasy, no worries there. We have a fixed money supply. And our money demand, and, and, and this is just a, this is a very simplified version of the liquidity preference theory. Um, and I will go into this in much greater detail in a class that I teach called Money and Banking, where we'll, we'll really flesh out what were those three motives for holding money and all that stuff. And that's not as relevant to what we're doing right now. So for now, we're just going to skip over that and leave that for the next, next course that you'll take in macroeconomics. Um, and say that... Demand for real balances is this demand for liquidity. And that demand for liquidity is a function of the real interest rate. So now, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we have a money demand function, all right, or liquidity demand function. I actually like the term liquidity demand a little better. It's a little more modern. Um, demand function that's a function of the real interest rate, which in a sense we can think of as the price, at least within this model framework, the price of money or the rental price of money. 
And as price goes up, the quantity demanded of liquidity goes down. Why? Because, well, it costs us more to hold it. And the more the opportunity cost of holding money is, the less we want to try to hold. We want to, um, in the words of, I believe it was Irving Fisher, we want to conserve interest. And particularly what that means is we want to minimize our interest expense. All right, so equilibrium. Well, equilibrium is the same thing it always is. It's where the two um, intersect with one another. And that gives us our real interest rate. Now notice this is all in real terms. So the interest rate is real. We've got real balances. And the liquidity, it's demand for real potential purchasing power. All right, so it's all in terms of real balances. So these, everything here is adjusted for inflation. And so we have a real interest rate. And this, it's within this framework that we're going to, to model the determination of the real interest rate. So what happens if the Fed wants to raise the interest rate? Well, it could simply reduce the amount of nominal money in circulation, that M, right? And what happens if it does that? Well, then the new M over P supplied, money supply over P, or supply of real balances, because the price level doesn't change, remember prices are sticky because it's a sort run, um, would cause the supply of money to shift to the left, and we'll have a higher interest rate. Okay, so that in a nutshell is the liquidity preference theory. And we're going to use that in the next lecture to create or derive this so-called LM curve.